last time talking about Hodge structures, and I didn't do the most important thing. I didn't explain how this construction with uh, integration related to trees and so on produce actually the three filtrations, the mixed Hodge structure. So I did not do this last time, and I didn't state the theorem that the Hodge structure we get is the one which comes from for geometric reasons. And I actually decided that I'm not going to do this right now because I wanted to talk <coughs> about motivic correlators and geometry of symmetric spaces. So if I if will ever have time, I will do what I didn't do last time. But otherwise, the lecture will be split into different topics, and I want just to do one, one topic today. So, uh, so uh, it will be mostly about geometry, but the uh, so it's motivic correlators and geometry of local symmetric spaces is really uh, what I'm going to do today. And the plan is the following. So first of all, I'm going to talk about background, which I thought I'd talk a little bit, but I wanted to at least pronounce things which I need in order to talk about motivic correlators. So it'll take a little time. And then most of the lecture, I will be talking uh, about the subject and how it relates to the action of the Galois group on fundamental group of some simplest possible uh, curves. So uh, let me start with reminding. So we are dealing with two categories. So we have some field F, and we have category of, again, as I said, the, the first like 15 minutes will be, uh, basically, I will set the notations, mot mot motivic setup. But then uh, we go into uh, geometric stuff. So we have the category of pure motives. It's Grotendieck's. Uh, pure motives uh, over the field F. Uh, and uh, it's embedded to the category of mixed motives over F. So it's mixed motives. And I wanted this to be an abelian uh, tensor category. I want this to be, means it's conjectured to be a billion tensor category, and we very, very much do not have a billion category structure. Uh, it, if you had it, so it, like in the families, so for example, as many things come out, like standard conjectures, for example, as uh, Bellinson uh, showed about seven years ago. So it's, 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 a, it's a, the T structure, yeah, I'm not going to talk about, um, I mean, it, it's a big problem how to get T structure, but I assume we have it. So, <coughs> mm, uh, and in the situation I'm going to use a setup, we do have everything. So this is, will be over uh, spectrum of the number rings. So now uh, the main point is that there is, that objects here have canonical weight filtration, and therefore there is a canonical fiber functor from mixed motives to pure motives. So uh, this is the analog of the fiber functor we were using for Hoyt structures last time, which takes any object here and assigns to it uh, GUR W uh, of this object, which is by definition an object here. So again, it is assumed that any object here uh, has canonical weight filtration. And the functor m to wm is exact. So we have this fiber functor. And now uh, we can just uh, set that the uh, Lie algebra, motivic Lie algebra, is by definition the Lie algebra of derivations of this fiber functor, which uh, uh, Act via Leibniz rule on tensor products, which are uh, which respect the tensor products. So this is the definition. And again, last time we did it in another mixed category, mixed category of mixed Hodge structures, and there that's how we got the Hodge Galois group last time. So now this what is this? This is a Lie algebra in the abelian uh, tensor category of pure mixed motives. So now uh, this functor provides an equivalence between the category of uh, 
pure mixed motives and uh, Lie models, uh, we can just uh, say that uh, this functor omega mod uh, takes the category of mixed motives over f uh, to the category of uh, models over this Lie algebra. Uh, in the tensor category of pure models. And the assignment is the natural one. So you take object here. The fiber functor assigns to this GUR WM. And then this fellow acts by definition on it. So you get a uh, model over motivically algebra by definition. OK. Now, the main point is that uh, we do are supposed to have an object uh, in this category of mixed motives. This is pi 1 motivic of a curve. Notation is the same as last time. Uh, so this is, by definition, I mean, this is uh, an example of a uh, huge pro uh, mixed motive. And therefore, mm, but it has more structures, also Lie algebra in this category. Uh, and therefore, automatically from the formalism, we see that if you take this huge mixed motive, apply to it the fiber functor, which means take GUR W, then uh, uh, consider all, uh, then this uh, mm, uh, motivically algebra is supposed to act on this huge object. So it acts by endomorphism of this object. But more than that, it actually acts by derivations because the original guy uh, has a Lie structure. This is a Lie algebra. And as was explained on the first lecture, it should act by the special derivations. And so just out of the formalism, uh, we get the canonical map from the motivic Lie algebra to this guy. And now remember that this was what we called last time cyclic Lie algebra. This is cyclic tensor product of, uh, uh, can probably remind what this is in a minute. So <coughs> we get a map from here to here. So now let's dualize this map. So if you just formally dualize it, Then we get the map uh, I'm looking for. So we get a map, which I call motivic correlator map, from the dual space to this uh, Lie algebra to the uh, dual space of this Lie algebra, which I denoted this way, L motivic of f. So this is, by definition, the dual to Lie motivic and a Lie algebra. in the category we're talking about. So we get this basic object of study. And uh, now, before I proceed talking about uh, this motivic correlators, I need to tell you a little bit of information about the structure of uh, this motivic Lie algebra. Again, this is basic parts of the formalism. So if you have any. Uh, Lie algebra L, uh, L. then uh, you can assign to this the standard or cartan ellenberg complex of L. So this is by definition the following thing. So it takes the dual to this Lie algebra, and then it maps to wedge square of this Lie algebra by the dual to the commutator map. And then you extend it by Leibniz rule to the maps to lambda cube, and so on. So uh, this means that in our particular case, we have exactly the situation. So I can, uh, so this was true for any Lie L. But now let me pretend I took the one I consider, or T over F. Uh, 
So we get uh, a chain complex, and this is a chain complex in the category of pure motifs. So what we can do, we can take its cohomology, I its cohomology, and we can isolate uh, some isotypical component. So we take some pure object M, take its dual, and isolate isotypical M star isotypical component uh, of given type. So this belongs to EMF. And now the main point is that this is uh, just x i uh, between q of 0 and uh, the original motif you chose m in the category of mixed motifs over f, uh, tensor over endomorphisms of m, m star. So this is basically a single thing which uh, I need to know about this. And in particular, if you just take the kernel of the map from this uh, L motivic over F to wedge 2 L motivic over F and isolate M star as a typical component, then this is just X1. This is just a particular case of the previous formula, which is going to be used all the time. All right. So uh, we finished with the formalism, and now I want to give some examples. So So we're still talking about examples uh, in the category of all mixed motives. So if you want to get to uh, theorems, you have to go to realizations. Yes. Uh, so you have, first of all, you have object M. This object comes with endomorphism algebra. It's a simple object. It comes with endomorphism algebra. And so you can get the X group. And the X group is just a vector space. It's a let's say q or q bar vector space. Now you take, uh, uh, what you do, you take this q vector, sp you take the dual object m star with the coefficients given by this vector space. However, you don't take it literally with coefficients, you tensor it with and m, which x and there. Okay? So it is just a big, uh, simple, uh, it's a big semi-simple object whose, uh, and M star comes as a tip, as a, uh, uh, M star is counted as many times as, it, uh, as this shows. Okay? Now let's do the fol following example. Let's take um, X a curve. And so let's draw the picture. Um, so I wanted to know what are the uh, motivic correlators with some, tangent with some base point at some point A. Uh, of uh, the cyclic tensor product where what we do, we put here some point B and here we put H1 of, of some curve X. So the general formalism tells you that as soon as you have to, uh, so remember this is some point on your X. X is, let's say, regular. Uh, and uh, A is also point of X. And uh, this is the motif H1 of X. And whenever we do the, the cyclic tensor product of delta functions on B and H1, we get something as soon as we twist it by minus 1, by Tate. And so uh, I claim uh, the following, that this is nothing else but the, uh, you take point A minus B, and you consider the image in the Jacobian of X. And Mm? So remember that motivic correlators were defined by using a curve and, and some uh, base uh, point or t even better tangential base vector. Uh -huh. So this A points out to the base point at which we take the tangential vector. Okay? So the, the, the definition... Huh? You're calling it S0. Yeah. I mean, I, this is just an example. So I can call it, if you want, S0 and S. If this is less, maybe this is indeed a good idea. So let's do it this way, okay? So then the claim is that what you get, you recovered the element S minus, I don't know how to denote this, S minus S0 
understood as an element in the Jacobian. So this belongs to the Jacobian of x. So the key fact here is that if you take x1 between q of 0 and h1 of x, this is something of weight minus 1, then this is naturally. Uh, so x You're right. So if I really stick to my previous notation, this is x bar. Yes, 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 yes. OK? So the x1, the motivic x1, uh, is calculated by the Jacobian of your x bar, tensor q. This is an abelian group, tensor q. It's a, I can explain why this should be so, but it's a kind of basic fact uh, uh, of life here. This just corresponds to, I mean, the way you produce it is uh, you basically take h1 of x minus s0 and s you consider, and you get the mixed motive you wanted to get. So, but in any case, so I claim that, that you get the class in the Jacobian which corresponds to, uh, uh, to this uh, difference of these two points. And now uh, I wanted to apply this. So I want to say now uh, let x be a modular curve. And so uh, uh, one more comment. So in this case, so if s and s0 are torsion points, then this implies that this correlator is just 0. So that's what I'm going to use in a second. OK? Yes? Uh, this was from, uh, this is weight minus 1. Is that OK? OK. So now we are going to apply this and calculate the simplest. Uh, Sorry, yes? I'm not really with you. OK. So this diagram you wrote mm -hmm. gives an element of Seeley x star. Uh, it gives you an uh, element of x. Uh, x uh, so, so, so. I have it, first of all, it's give me some element uh, here. Because the motivic correlator map takes something from here and produce element of this motivic layout. But, but the diagram is supposed to give an element of C Exactly. So this diagram uh, lives here. Yes. And so when you apply the motivic correlator map, which is this map, you get something which lives here in the motivic Lie algebra. But you say you actually get. Yes, 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 yes. So you, you're right. I, I'll, I'll, I'll explain what your point is and uh, just write this more carefully. So your point is that we get not a vector space, but vector space with some coefficients, so to speak. And I didn't write this coefficient. Well, I haven't got that far yet. I mean, first of all, it's in this kernel, is it? Uh, yes, it is. Good point. So it is, thank you. It's in the kernel for trivial reason because uh, this algebra is graded by the weights. So if you're talking about Lee core algebra is graded by positive weights, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. And in this case, so in, in, in degree 0, just q. I mean, there's just nothing if you take Lie algebra, just 0. But if you take, uh, it, we got something in degree 1. And there is no room for co-multiplication, because co-multiplication is going to take you in degree at least 2. So whatever you produced in degree 1 is going to be x to 1. Now x1 of whom? In order to figure out x1 of whom, you look at this diagram. And so what you're supposed to do here, you're supposed to take tensor product of q of minus 1, which is the motif of this guy. Tensor, the motif you're talking about here, h1 of x. But then don't forget that you're supposed to uh, twist it back. That's a plus here. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I'm talking about, let me set my notations just a second. I'm talking about cohomology. So, sorry, I. Now this is okay. There was. A, uh, we're talking about cohomology. Huh? 
What? Oh, bar, 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 bar. Yes. So we get uh, we get tensor product from here and from here, but then we have to twist it. So this is plus one now because we, uh, this is just a second. So it's uh, minus one and plus one. So this is plus one. Okay. So we have to twist it by one, and these two guys cancel. So this is the isotypical component where we where we land. Okay. This is important. This is important point. So I, I'm explaining how I calculate as the isotypical component where my correlator lands on this example. So what I do, I do tensor product of all motifs I see here on this circle and twist it by plus one. Okay. Hmm? Uh, this, this, on this circle, we have just some objects which lives here. Lives in silly, huh? Subobject, sub yes. So I'm just telling you what this subobject is. So this uh, subobject is a product of uh, Q of uh, minus one and H one. Twisted by one because you always twist by fundamental class of the curve. And so in the end of the day, you just get subobject which lives in H one of X. Okay. Oh yeah, I assume I have smooth projective curve. Yes, yes. I, as in our setup, X bar is smooth projective curve over field F. No, I didn't say, but I don't care whether it's reducible or not, but uh, actually you asked uh, different questions and answered. Uh, so uh, you get uh, something in H1. How this H1 is decomposed is not my business. So it what can be. Then I suppose to take, then I suppose uh, break it on simple objects and write down projections to each of the simple objects. So if I don't want to spend time on this, let's assume it's reducible, but that's not important. Okay? Then I also break Jacobian according to this pieces and so on. Okay? All right. So, so, uh, is it okay now? Yes. Okay. So now you want to play this game, but with a more complicated uh, object. Uh, M star is H1. So in this case, I assume that X is reducible. So M star is H1 of X bar. So I got uh, element in the motivically coalgebra here, uh, which is of whose isotypical type is H1 of X bar. Yes, yes, yes. That, that's this was the question which I anticipated. So it's uh, supposed to write this Jacobian of x bar tensor Q. And if you box this with your h1 of x bar, then this guy uh, is just a component of this motivically, which, co which of component h1 of x bar. Okay? Your answer lies just with the copy. Hmm? Your answer S minus is not lies just with the copy. Okay, let me say this again. Do I have a space left? So if you take I'm writing. If you take this motivically algebra and consider its isotypical com component which correspond to first dimensional cohomology of, uh, of curve X, which I assume is reducible for simplicity only, then the answer is that this is the Jacobian of X bar, of X bar, tensor Q, tensor, or box times, H1 of X bar. Because this is an uh, element of the category of pure motifs, which sits here, and there's, uh, there is, uh, uh, there's nothing else there, as the calculation of X1 shows. I do I do produce it naturally because I have H1 in my correlator. It so, so the ah, correlator yes. really applied to an element the of H1. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. you get that. Yes. 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 So yes. this diagram is a one-dimensional vector space, right? Uh, it's not one dimensional. Uh, it corresponds to one dimensional. Okay. So. Space. 
Yes, yes, yes. Uh, the Jacobian is something. Yeah, yes. Yes, okay. All right. Now I want to play a little more complicated game and a little more I interesting. So I wanted to take this correlator. So I assume that x, x is a modular curve. And so I put here my s or delta s depends. Oh, actually, mm, okay, let me write it this way. So I put here s. And then I put here h1 of x bar. And I put here h1 of x bar. So let's consider correlators which corresponds to this picture. Okay. And then uh, uh, we can do two things with this correlator. So first of all, we can assume that our field f, in, uh, like in this case, is a modular curve. So we can embed two complex numbers. And we can calculate the Hodge correlator of this diagram. Okay. Then I claim that the Hodge correlator will be exactly one of the rankin solberg integrals. Because by definition, what you're supposed to do uh, in the calculation, so you're supposed to draw the circle and put here your s, then some holomorphic and anti-holomorphic form to make them non-trivial integral, and uh, integrate the green function as x alpha beta bar over x bar of c. So this is a rankin solberg OK? This was uh, the construction from, from, from previous lecture. So how you assign to, how you assign to, to a correlator is Hodge. I thought I was getting it and I last time we got a differential on c2. What, what, what? Didn't we get a differential on c2? Yes, but there was a discussion uh, which, uh, which is saying that the essential part, if you, if you look uh, the part which uh, actually gives you the hodge galois group, that you just take the number which tends. Uh, in this case, there is, no, there is no base. And you just get a number. So this number. So if we would have a base, and uh, we would produce one form I was doing last time, so we would get this number multiplied by uh, zdw minus wdz plus differential of this. But over the base, let me maybe say this. Over a point, uh, if you take the Hodge correlator of a diagram like that, Put S alpha beta. Then you get you get one form, but this one form is the integral of G S X alpha wedge beta uh, multiplied by this extra one form on the twister plane, which we absolutely don't care uh, at the moment because it, it is just looks like a fudge factor. So the 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 the, the Hodge correlator is just this number. Well, multiplied by this one form, but if you really look uh, at its Hodge realization, just keep this number. Okay. All right. So in Hodge uh, realization, we got the rankin solberg integral. Now let's see what we get in the Mativik realization. So here I need little calculations. So I start again with this picture. So have S. Uh, then h1 and h1. But now I need to calculate the uh, co-product uh, of this element. So I claim that if I take the uh, motivic correlator of this guy and calculate the co-product for this, then this is 0. This is my lemma. That's a very important claim, because it immediately tells you that you get x1. And this is precisely the x1, the motivic x1, whose regulator is the rankin solberg integral. And so what I'm explaining in this lemma, that if you look both on motivic and Hodge correlators, then you see, first of all, the rankin solberg integral. And secondly, you see immediately that it comes from motivic x1. Okay? Why from motivic x1? Because the coproduct of this guy is 0. So by the 
uh, by this formulas I wrote down there, by the motivic formalism, it immediately tells you that you have element in X1. Okay? This implies that this correlator motivic applied to the circle S. When S is a torsion point, S is a crucial, S is a cusp uh, on uh, your modular curve, and therefore, uh, actually, uh, I need to be uh, a little more precise. I need to take difference of two scars. I, I need to take here, I'll tell in a second. I need to take here D, which is degree zero divisor, uh, I think, uh, on cusps. But in fact, sorry, I kind of get. L let me first assume that I said we just have a cusp. Then we'll see whether they have. I need another cusp which is a base point, and so I was trying to say it in a different way, but let me just take another, put it in definition here, okay? All right. So, effectively, I have two cusps, but. Okay, so I claim that if you take the motivic correlator of uh, this guy, then uh, it defines an element in x1 by q of 0 and h1 tensor h1. Uh, no twists. Because uh, by the rules of the game, you're going to get h1 tensor h1 tensor q of 1 uh, times q of minus 1. So the, the, the tate shifts canceled. And you cleanly get the duals. I, uh, yeah, I always suppress it so I can put it. Yes. But what this second part of the tensor product tells you, it tells you in which is a typical component you live in your motivically algebra. So the main content of the statement is that you get some class here. Is that clear? Huh? Now, the only, thi the only thing I need to prove, I need to prove that I have element whose coproduct is 0. So let me do this. But then I, I stress that it's, uh, uh, the, the picture gives you all you wanted. So it gives you uh, rankin selberg integral and its motivic element, which, uh, whose regulator is this rankin selberg integral. It is, of course, a well-known construction due to Balenson, well, I would say Bloch and Balenson, but uh, the way we get it, so we don't go on modular curves. This is the subject of the seminar, the student seminar, like, like about two weeks ago, so we were, we were talking about this class. So we get it in a different way without doing explicit construction. Okay, now let's handle the uh, coproduct. So in order to handle coproduct, I need to redraw this picture as this Holmes and X I was doing last time. So it will, look like that. So I have delta function, q, q, and q. Because remember that this is canonical home in degree 0. This is canonical x2, uh, so degree 2. This is uh, canonical, h this is h1, and this is h1. So this picture reproduces me the one uh, this is the way I treat the one on the left. So I, I treat it as this uh, cyclic tensor product of Ho for Holmes and X. And now the only question is how I calculate uh, the coproduct. And I claim that to, to calculate coproduct, whenever you have any picture like that, so you have like S, Q. Sorry, that's right. Yes. Read the decorations you put on the two upper red arrows. Upper red. This is zero. You mean this? Uh, yeah. Zero, two, sorry. Probably should move here. <coughs> now, the only question, and that's an important question for today's lecture, how you calculate the coproduct. <coughs> and so the way you do it is always this. So you have the cyclic elements, like delta S1, Q, Q. 
delta s2 q q q and so uh, you i calculate coproduct huh is in general case when you have s and q yes 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 and so what you need to do in general so you need to cut but how you cut so uh, you need to cut like this way between delta and q or you also may cut between q and q uh, let me just do it like that this is the only two cuts which you can consider and so when you cut, so you just cut the circle into pieces and put uh, identity map on the cohomology between them. So this doesn't quite matter because I'm going to show that no matter how you cut here, you get zero. Because here, if you cut like that, for example, so you're going to end up with this half circle, which is zero because as I just explained, this is torsion element in the Jacobian, okay? So this means that this cut is dead gives you zero, okay? Uh, I, I can do any cut I like which, which uh, does not connect delta and delta. I can cut delta Q or QQ. Uh, so there are more than the one you hmm? There are more than the one you the, the what? Oh, I do all of them. I do all of them, yes. I do all of them. And consider some of all cuts. But here in this case, there are only two cuts I can do. And, so yeah. You said you do this cut. Yeah. You, you, you're getting some coefficient. Or I mean, you when you I do that, so I calculate. Two circles, but you. Mm -hmm. so, so remember that in the first lecture, we were discussing the Lie algebra structure. Yes. The Lie algebra structure, how it goes. You take two circles and you put them together whenever you see two objects uh, which fit together. Yes. Now we kind of doing the dual of this. This, meet, this means that we cut in every, uh, so we cut between two objects, get two circles, and decorate them by these two objects which you see. So for example here, if cut means that uh, we produce out of this circle like that, uh, one, two, Q, and uh, like that. Uh, one, two, three, four, and delta function. Okay? Yes. Now, in this case, I don't worry about putting some coefficients here because there is uh, they're oriented. There is a home standing here and x2 standing here, but they're absolutely canonical. It's just canonical one here and canonical element there, multiplied by uh, Tate object. Can we uh. we've got, uh, q to q to this one. Yes. So then I get one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And so you get delta Q, 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 uh, delta. Okay? So I get two circles, but then it's important that here I have. Uh, I have to put something here uh, because there is a canonical element in H1, uh, original tensor H1. There is a canonical element here which you can call the identity. And so what I'm doing, I'm putting this identity here. I'm inserting, inserting it's one, one edge gets this H1 and the other gets the other H1. Okay? And also doing something, remember that this comes with a Tate twist. It's, it's, a, it's a tensor. So it's a tensor in H1, tensor H1. Yeah, but I mean, it's not Q, it's sum of several tensors. So what is sum of several tensors? Yes. 
Yes, yes, yes. It's sum of several, alpha I, beta I, it's sum of several terms. All right? And it's an obvious order to put, I mean, you want something in the... <laughs> <laughs> we, we discussed this <laughs> last time. So, so, yes, there is a natural order, and it, 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 it's, it's... I can answer this question again about the order. I feel it will be a little bit uh, overkill. So the answer is yes, there is a natural order, and everything is good. Uh, because uh, uh, here, mm, the element, I maybe o m let me opt not to go into, into this detail right now. Again, I'm saying that last time we had a detailed discussion of, of orderings and why it doesn't matter using the skew symmetry. Uh, of, so we use here the skew symmetry of the Poincare pairing. So this is basically Poincare pairing and it's skew symmetric. Because of that, uh, you, you can settle the order. So I just don't want to go to this because I'm not using this and uh, it's already a little complicated. Okay, so the main message is that I can cut delta to Q and Q to Q and then put naturally the, the, the identity on the cohomology group if there's uh, a, 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 on these two uh, sides, okay? Now I'm saying that if you do cuts here, you get zero by the previous lemma. You can cut this way, you cut this way. In any case, you get something like delta Q delta. This is zero because that's torsion Jacobian. So we finished. And, and you're not allowed to cut no. Q to Q no. next uh, uh, I do not, and yeah. OK. I don't cut neighbors. Yeah. All right. So this was a little complicated discussion, maybe. But uh, uh, we got something, as I said. We got uh, the idea that uh, the Hodge correlators allows us to see uh, what kind of motivic correlator we get very efficiently if you go to Hodge realization. And then, if it's a good luck, if you get element of x1, this allows you to see the this is zeta elements. All right, but now, as I promised, now I want to go to a very concrete example. <laughs> but let's now do the GM minus N storage points. So, uh, next example, and this will be a long discussion almost for, for the whole lecture, that we take x to be gm minus mu n, and we take the tangential base point as infinity as we were talking about before. Uh, so t is 1 over z. And uh, then there are still a uh, couple of foundational results about this. Uh, uh, so you can take first Q, but you, it, you, will, you will see the natural, I, I, the natural, okay. So let me introduce a scheme as N, which is just a spectrum of uh, Z of Zn with one n inverted, and in the end of the day, the statement will be that this guy sleeps not exactly over field but over the scheme. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, as I said, I need some uh, background on this. So this is a guy which you want to study and which we want to relate to geometry of symmetric spaces for GL2, GL3, GL4. Uh, but first of all, some background. Let's suppose that we have any number field. And uh, let's denote by OFS, as usual, a uh, ring of S integers. Where S is a finite subset. Then there are the following two results which I needed. So this is written in our paper with uh, Pierre Deligne. So it is, uh, I believe, somewhere around 203 on, on the web. 
and it definitely uh, on the web page in the institute. Uh, so the theorem says two things. First of all, that there exists an abelian uh, tensor category MT of OFS of mixed state motifs over uh, this uh, scheme uh, spectrum of OFS. Uh, and secondly, uh, it, there exists means that it has all the properties we wanted it to have. So we can work with this without any problem. And the second question, which is uh, crucial, is that if one take there exists also this pi 1m of gm minus mu n v infinity, and it belongs to this category. Mixed state motives over the scheme I indicated. So this is the answer to your question. OK. So because of it, basically because of the second, first and second part, we can now apply the machinery of correlators and see what we get. Mm. So we get a map. So let, let's have a notation. So let's L of Sn be uh, the motivic Lie algebra, motivic Tate, sorry, Lie algebra uh, of this category of mixed state motives over uh, Sn. I just need this scheme. And so this is a graded algebra. Uh, because uh, this is motivic Tate algebra. So this means that we take not the huge motivically algebra, but we take only part of the motivically algebra, which corresponds to the typical components, which are, which are Tate motives Q of n. And so we get sub uh, Cauli algebra. So, uh, here we get a Lie algebra. And this Lie algebra is graded by uh, negative numbers, which are exactly the motives Q of n. So in the previous language, I would write something like, Something like that, but I just skip it. OK, so we have this motivically algebra. And uh, therefore, uh, we have the motivic correlator map. So once again, as soon as we have curve, uh, and uh, this curve produces mix, huge mixed state motive. And so we can apply the previous general construction in this case. And it tells us that we have a map from this C Lee dual related to this uh, GM minus mu n with a point at infinity to uh, the dual uh, coalgebra of this scheme, Sn. So this is now positively graded. Co-algebra, Lie co-algebra. Okay. So let's study this. First of all, let's introduce a uh, definition. Let's say that the cyclotomic Lie algebra of mu n is by definition the image of this map, let's call it. OK, let's move of this correlator map. So this is the object which you want to study. You want to study this uh, cyclotomic Lie algebra and see how uh, it looks like. We are doing this for many reasons, but one of them is that studying this uh, Lie algebra is essentially the same thing as studying the action of the Galois group of Q bar over QL to infinity and n acting on the prior completion of the fundamental group. And that's a more classical object. 
but the study is equivalent. One is equivalent to each other. OK, so uh, how we study this uh, Lie algebra? So we wanted to understand uh, how these uh, correlators live inside this Lie algebra. And so let's just make a notation. So we say that we have motivic correlator, which corresponds to some root of unity and then bunch of zeros. And then again, root of unity and then bunch of zeros. And so this comes n1 times. This comes n2 times, and so on. This comes uh, n m times. So this is, by definition, this motivic correlator, which I applied to a complicated circle. Uh, so I put a circle on the circle. So I put one root of unity, zeta 0, then I put 0, 0, 0, then I put zeta 1, then 0, 0, 0, 0, then I put zeta 2, and so on. Uh, what I'm doing, I'm saying that uh, on my projective line minus mu n and 0, all the points I have are just roots of unity and zeros. Yes? No, 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 no. It's, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, sorry, it's a confusion of two languages. So here it's absolutely allowed. But if you want to make a, a picture with uh, sheaves, then we put here like this delta of 0, q, q, then delta of, uh, I don't know, 1, q, q, and so on. So when I'm looking for the picture this way, I, I, I draw my circle, which is like puncture it. If I'm going to do the other one, I'm going to put a solid circle. But here it's absolutely OK. We can apply Hodge correlator to any cyclic product we like. Okay. All right, so that's the definition. Now, it has two characteristics. One is the weight, which is n1 plus and so on plus nm minus 1. And one is the depth, which is m. I'm telling you that the GLD is going to appear with respect to d, the depths. And uh, now let's see. So first of all, uh, Sorry, yes. Oh, 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 so so you have here. Let me see. Do I have it correctly? No. N zero, N one. Yes. So depth is a number of this. No, no, uh, depth is a how many roots of unity you have minus one. Uh, just a definition, yes. It's two important numbers which associate to any correlator like that. All right. Now let's see first examples. And that first sum is supposed to begin at definition of W is supposed to begin at N zero or not. Oh yes. I'm sorry. Yes. This corresponds to depth in the descending proportion of that notebook. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And weight is the usual weight uh, in 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 algebraic geometry. OK. So first of all, why I call it cyclotomically algebra? Because let's calculate the simplest possible uh, part of this guy. The trivial guy is, uh, if you take, maybe I just So if you take uh, the depth 0 part, this means that you take uh, the depth uh, should be called d. I don't have ability to write it, but the depth filtration will be denoted by d. So if you take d0 of the sig of mu n, it's already a statement. I claim that 0. Now, how would I know this is true? So if I look to any correlator, Hodge correlator, for example. There are many ways you can explain. But if you look to any correlator which has, uh, uh, yeah. Which one? Which? Oh, this is a depth filtration. OK. D depth filtration. It's filtration by this number D. So I'm saying that this uh, 
that this guy, this guy, has a grading and filtration as a Lie algebra. This is actually a statement, not completely trivial, that the Lie co-algebra, uh, cyclotomic Lie co-algebra, is graded by the weight and only filtered by depths. Okay. So you look. So this cyclotomic Lie algebra, by its definition, is just spanned by these cyclic words, right? Each cyclic so word. No intrinsic definition. It just comes from the. There is intrinsic definition, which I'm skipping. Oh. There is intrinsic definition, but I just didn't want to, to tell you this. The intrinsic definition is uh, related to embedding of GM minus mu n to GM. Let me not uh, tell it at least right now. Okay. There is uh, intrinsic definition of the de depth filtration. OK, but I wanted to say that, first of all, the, the zeros pass of, of uh, this depth filtration is trivial, is zero. But the first one is already interesting. So it's if it the decreasing or increasing It's uh, increasing. So you have the number. So you have uh, elements which has depth 1, depth 2, depth 3, and so on. And you sum from depth 0 to depth m. This is your depth m part is when the number of zetas, the roots of unity, less or equal to m. Okay. All right. So I have this D0 statement. Yes. I, I already thought it's telling me something like the action of the homology, the Galois action of the homology of gm minus mu n. The, the D0 cuts the pi 1 down to this billionization, right? Uh, No, you're right, but 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 you're right, but but it's it's you, you cut it to pure motive. So the, the 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 Lie algebra we're talking about is zero. The Lie algebra fills only mixed motives. So you you the the, the depth zero part is zero. Okay. So we have the cyclotomic Lie algebra, this one, and uh, any element of this Lie algebra is just a collection of roots of unity. You count how many of them you have and some zeros which you insert between them. So I claim that, uh, I can explain why, that if you take just the uh, correlators when you have just one root of unity, it's just plain zero. So can we talk in terms of Galois actions, which I feel maybe I could, uh, yeah. cyclotomic character still, the action of H1. Uh, can, I, can I just wait for one second, so you'll, yeah. you maybe you will see the answer to your, to your question, OK? J just yeah, yeah, just yeah. let me talk about uh, depth one. So if you take. Uh, GUR with respect to depth filtration 1 of this cyclotomic uh, Lie algebra, and I take piece of uh, weight omega, then this is canonically identified with a K group K2 omega minus, minus 1 of Sn tensor Q. So in particular, if you take sig 1 of mu n, this is just uh, uh, O of Sn star. This is just uh, Z group. So uh, this is weight, yes, yes. So this Lie algebra is graded by the weight, OK? And so I claim that if you take the first non-trivial piece, the, the graded, the piece of, uh, of depth 1 and uh, split it by the grading, then you recover precisely all k groups of your base scheme. So this is a group of cyclotomic units. And so my point is that this Lie algebra is a kind of vast analog of the group of cyclotomic units. Okay, so the cyclotomic units appear as a very bottom part of this Lie algebra. Let me have some. Oh yeah, this is a theorem, but you will see that it's obvious from what we know. It's it will be just one 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 line theorem. Yeah. yeah. 
But yeah. What? What, what, what we call cyclotomic units is precisely that. One minus zeta is a so-called cyclotomic unit. It's not a unit, but it's called, I don't know, I think this is a language, right? <laughs> <laughs> so this guy, if you take what, what I think Pierre says, he complains that this is not a unit. No? no? Huh? So I will have, you will see what I have, but I will have exactly uh, elements like that. That's all I have. One minus z tend to alpha. Okay? Huh? All right. So let me draw a little roadmap of this, how this uh, uh, Lie algebra looks like. So it has two numbers. One is a depth and one is a weight. And so when you want to see a different components of this, let's take you take associate graded. So what you actually do, you draw a line here, and then you have non-trivial groups which standing everywhere here. But in particular, you can start uh, taking something which lives in the weight. This is weight one. Then you're talking just about this piece. And so this is just an abelian group, okay? So this is, uh, if you take, for example, GUR uh, with respect to this depth filtration of this cyclotomic guy, and this F by graded Lie algebra, or I Lie co-algebra in this case. I decided to dualize. And that's why we can, in principle, have any non-trivial components, because uh, one of the numbers, W, uh, is always bigger than D, so D is less or equal than W. Sasha, that right hand side, is it the square D1 of L of SN? Sorry, I didn't hear. That right hand side. This one? Above. Yes. Uh, that's, uh, that's the weight W component of GRD1 of L of SN. Is that right? Which, this one? Um, it should be placed on the, the sick by the L of SN. If I replace what? But this assertion says that. Yes, yes, uh, uh, yes, 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 yes. You're making a very good point. So, so the, the, uh, the, the point actually making is he's saying that it turns out that our cyclic Lie coalgebra, which sits inside of the Galo uh, Tate Lie coalgebra of SN, actually has the same generators as this Galo Lie coalgebra. This is an extremely important point. Okay? Are they equal? No, that's the whole point of the lecture. <laughs> I mean, the answer is complicated. It's some. One thing can change and another with the same generator. One, one is uh, so. So, so you have a map. You first of all, you're talking. I'm talking about Lie co-algebras. Remember that co-algebras. This means that I'm talking about a quotient of this uh, motivic state Lie algebra. So, so, so six. Six is a co. It's a co-algebra. It's a, co a Lie co-algebra. Yeah. So therefore, uh, it embeds to some bigger guy which is motivic tate Lie algebra. Yes. If you dualize this, then you see that motivic tate Lie algebra, Lie algebra, has a quotient, which is oh, dual if to... I dualize, if you dualize, then dualize it. Yes, yes. So, if you do, so w the comment which actually uh, made was the following. He said that actually already this first line proves that this uh, mm, uh, cyclotomic Lie algebra has the same exactly generators as the motivic tate algebra. So the, on the level generators, this is the, the map one from the other is isomorphism. And it proves that because somehow it's known that uh, it proves. I mean, you you have. I mean, I think that the only reason you have problem with seeing this is because I didn't give you a little bit more background. So let me give you this background, so which, which makes this claim claim completely evident. So. Uh, it's a good time now for this comment. So how in general uh, uh, we see uh, what's going on? So if you take, remember that if you take this motivically co-algebra of any ring of FS integers, so it maps to lambda square 
of the score algebra of ring of of integers, and if you take the kernel of this map, then this is uh, the same as x one. We know all this, so it's not hypothetical. M t of O f s between q of zero and q of w. If you decided to pay attention to w isotopic part here. And this is, again, known to be k2 minus 1 of this ring of OFS tensor q. And uh, in particular, uh, L1 of OFS is OFS star tensor q. So this result uses actually lots of things. So it uses Borel theorem. Uh, constructions of Bellinson regulators and uh, Voivodsky thing. So it's 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 not uh, uh, that obvious statement. Uh, it uses lots of machine, but it's there. So you can you can see all reference details and so why it's there. Yes. So because of that. Uh, it makes obvious the comment of Akshay because he said, look, so this k2 minus 1 of Sn is precisely what we get when we consider here the motivic date leak algebra of the scheme Sn. OK? All right. Uh, there is one, since I'm talking about this, there is one more piece of background that if you consider the regulator map, which is a map from x to 1, from mixed state OFS between Q of 0, Q of W, uh, two, and I wanted to make it, I, I don't like make it the most uh, strong way. I just wanted to embed it, to map it to home from F to C uh, of X1, <coughs> R of 0. R of W. This is a Hodge realization map. So the claim is that this map is injective. I can easily make it isomorphism. I just don't want to. I don't use it. So now these two lines uh, brings us to main conclusion, which I'm going to use all the time. I found this uh, probably the most important piece of this ideology here is for me. So if you take any element x in this Lie algebra of OFS, then this element x is 0 if and only if two things happen. First of all, the coproduct of this element is 0. And the regulator defines this way of this element is 0. So the injectivity of regulator, this is the work of Borel, again, on zeta function. Okay, so I emphasize. You take any element x in this motivic Lie algebra. Okay. Yes. And you want to know whether this element zero or not. But this regulator is just defined on these x one. Yes, yes, yes. So I didn't give the proof. So I'm proving this fact. So you want to know whether this element is 0 or not. You impose first conditions that the coproduct of this element is 0. It's obviously necessary, right? Yeah. But if the coproduct is 0, this just means, we discussed this a little before, that x belongs to x1 between q of 0 and q of w. Now then the second statement takes care of this x1. It says that if you see it in all realization, see that it's 0, then it is 0. So I said that, at least for me, this is the most important conclusion of all of that, because it tells you that you have absolute control of this motivic Lie algebra. You basically know whatever you would like to know about it if you know the coproduct and the Hoche realization, but basically the coproduct. And uh, uh, in our case, this is actually how you see th this isomorphism. So using this key conclusion, the, the isomorphism becomes basically obvious after a little calculation. I want to tell you which calculation in a second. OK? So I need to check two things. I need to check. So for example, this, this guy. So how do you see this? 
So we have element of SIG1, and it's by definition has zero coproduct because there is no room for the coproduct. It lives in such a part. Did I erase this? The guy here has no room for coproduct because it lives in the smallest possible weight. It cannot co multiply anywhere. So you take this element here, and uh, it already gives you x1. And uh, then, uh, so, so, so how do you know that you get uh, the whole x1? Then the only thing you need to do, you need to calculate the regulator. But regulator of whom? So you just draw the, the guy which gives you this uh, correlator, uh, just like s1. Let me call it zeta 1 and zeta 2. Okay? This is the guy which gives you this correlator. And then, so I claim that when you apply the motivic correlator to this guy, you just get element zeta 1 minus zeta 2 modulo to torsion at least. That's, that's uh, who, who it is. Okay? Now, how do you see it? You see it because if you apply the Hodge realization, you're going to get logarithm of zeta 1 minus zeta 2 because that's a green function on the projective line. And so up to torsion, this proves the statement. I can prove it honestly, but I just want to say that if you want to, to have quick idea model torsions, then it's after this, it's obvious. OK? Here you mean you can see. Hmm? Here you, you mean you take log with respect to all embeddings? Yes, yes, yes. So look at this, where it was. OK? The same way, so I'm going to, to, to stop in three minutes. The same way I, you prove the whole formula. So, you, so the formula tells you that uh, you get k2 uh, minus 1. Why? Because the first thing you check is that all these correlators, when you have just two zetas, have zero coproduct. And then you just calculate the integral, which I was defining last time. And you see that this integral is just n log. And this proves the claim. Uh, Mm. Okay. So the one thing you do, I need to calculate the regulator when I put one zero, one z and many zeros. So this is the Hodge correlator of this guy. And the claim is here z is not necessarily torsion point, tor 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 torsion. This is for any z in C. And the, the result of the calculation is that you get n logarithm, who is n, n is a number uh, of this element. So th this is uh, weight equals n. So we get some with some rational coefficients, which I don't want to bother you, but which is well, this is calculated. Lee n minus k of z. So the result of the calculation of the regulator, the integral can be computed explicitly, just gives you linear combination of Lee n's. But what's important for us that if absolute value of z is one, then almost all these terms die because they're just logs of absolute value. Then we just get real or imaginary part of just function the n of zeta. And then looking at those numbers when zeta primitive roots of unity, you immediately see all Dirichlet characters, and so you're done. So assuming I convince you that the uh, coproduct is 0, this proves the statement that you get all k theory and not a part of it, because we managed to get in the regulator all Dirichlet L functions and not part of them. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. OK? So just, just about this calculation, the last uh, bit of information, how this, this kind of calculation goes. So what exactly I'm proving here? So the simplest non-trivial integral is this. You have three points like z1 and z2 and z3 on projective line. And you integrate them over projective lines. So you end up with integral over CP1 of logarithm of absolute value x minus z1 dc logarithm of absolute value x minus z2 dc 
logarithm of absolute value x minus z3. And the answer is you alternate also the z's to make it more symmetric. So the answer is this is just a block Wigner dialogarithm of the cross ratio of infinity z1, z2, and z3. And the block Wigner dialogarithm, this is just a measuring part of the usual dialogarithm uh, plus logarithm of 1 minus z times logarithm of absolute value of z. So this is a Hodge correlator integral, this one. The upper C means d minus d bar. So this is probably the simplest Hodge correlator integral I uh, can imagine. It is on CP1, and it is for the simplest Mercedes diagram. And it, it reproduces the logarithm. And you already see here that this Hodge correlator game is different than uh, the usual way we apply, we define the dialogarithm. Because usually, when you apply the dialogarithm, you write something like uh, Li2 of z is integral from 0 to z log of 1 minus t dt over t over some path, which going to point z from 0. And this is just integral, iterate integral, or integral over simplex if you write log as an integral. But this is very much different than this one. This is integral of something non-holomorphic over the whole CP1. So these two integrals are really different. And that happens all the time. So when you, the claim that the Hodge correlators integral reproduce uh, the periods of the material fundamental group amounts to the claim that you have a completely different set of integrals to calculate these periods, which in the case of uh, the modular curve, as we have seen, these integrals are precisely the rankin solberg type integrals in the simplest possible case. And if you would look to, to that integral, that you will not recognize them uh, at all. OK, let me stop here. So this is a kind of calculation which is done here for, for general n, and uh, it proves the statement about depth 1. OK? So in order to uh, proceed, I need to remind you, stated again, the formula for the coproduct of these motivic correlators. In the simplest possible situation, when your curve is p1 uh, and uh, s is any uh, subset, not necessarily roots of unity, then there is basically one thing you do. You cut. But you cut, uh, you take some point s here, and you cut uh, in between other s's. Uh, this may be look confusing, but if you remember that secretly we were talking about all the skews standing here. Uh, so what you really do, you cut in between uh, delta function and q. But you don't want to keep in your head all the skews. So you just if you keep, keep just this s's, which is the only data you see, then you just cut between s and, and arc. And so when you cut, so you get two halves. So, so this goes to the sum of all cuts. And in this particular case, just remind that you get s1, s2, s3, and nothing else, which s4, s5, S6 and S1 in their natural order. And, and the order is everything is cyclically invariant. Now, why this comment is of importance for us? Because I said I proved, but I still didn't check that this uh, 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 correlator, which has just two zetas, dies on the coproduct. So we have some correlator where we have two zetas and a bunch of zeros. Now, uh, if you're going to apply coproduct, you're going to cut. But if you cut, this is example. If you cut, you cut from zeta somewhere. And uh, you get out of this a picture where at least one piece of this picture has just a single zeta. And that's 0, because that's, I already said that's 0. So that's it. So this proves the claim that the coproduct is 0. OK? All right, so I will need this formula in a second. But now, what's the next step? 
uh, the next step is to see what happens here. So now we want to go one stage up, and so we want to see how the next stage of this uh, object looks like. So this next stage is a, a complex of length, length two because you have it like sig two of mu n, that what stands here, going by coproduct to wedge square of sig one of mu n. And this guy is a very clear what it is, it's just wedge two of uh, the group of cyclotomic units by the previous calculation. And so basically all we want to know, we want to know who this guy is and how the coproduct looks like. Now, in order to uh, see this, we need to look again on the coproduct, but now in the case when you have three zetas. Uh, so, I want to make a, a claim. So, <coughs> So first of all, this sig 2 of mu n is spanned by uh, the following guys. You can take correlator of three roots of unity or correlator of two roots of unity and one zero. There's nothing else. And these guys, we already know who they are. These guys, you give look cleanly k3 of sn, tensor q. So all we wanted to know what these guys are doing, who they are. But in order to answer this question, well, well let me first state the answer. It's a theorem. Uh, so the theorem tells you dihedral symmetry uh, of uh, the CM of zeta 1, zeta 2, zeta 3. And so it tells you, first of all, that if you take this guy CM of roots of unity, which you interchanged by some permutation, then this is minus 1 to parity of sigma. Uh, this CM of zeta 1, zeta 2, zeta 3. So there they fix the sign when it permutes them. And the second claim is that if you take CM of zeta 1 inverse, zeta 2 inverse, zeta 3 inverse, then n, n plus CM of zeta 1 zeta 3, zeta, zeta 2, zeta 3, this belongs to K3. I mean, this belongs to smaller depths. So up model of smaller depths, uh, these two things satisfy uh, covariance under the group, which is the Hidler group of order 12. OK. So how do you prove, I mean, this is a general principle. How do you prove any statement about any relation, any formula on the blackboard which involves these correlators? So you look at this key conclusion, which says that you apply coproduct number one and see that it, it, it has to uh, kill this relation. If it doesn't, you prove that it's not 0. And if it does, you still have to look at the integral and see if that integral has the same symmetry, the same kind of relation. If you have both, you're done. Okay. So in this case, Just applying the formula which you see on the left, uh, you have the coproduct. So the coproduct of the CM of zeta 1, zeta 2, zeta 3 is just zeta 1 minus zeta 2, which zeta 2 minus zeta 3 plus cyclic permutations of this. So where do you get this formula from? So you again, you look at the circle, and you see three zetas here. And so all you do, you, you make a cut, 
but up to cyclic symmetry it's just one cut. So when you do one cut, you end up with a circle with two zetas here and circles with two zetas here, which by previous discussion, they leave in weight one, give you just the cyclotomic units, the difference between the zetas. So that's it, so the formula is proved, okay? Now you clearly see from this formula that it has the first property. Uh, you maybe don't see clearly, but I claim that after very little calculation, you will see that it has a second property. And uh, I mean, it has the second property that it's killed by the coproduct, uh, which all this is proves only, it doesn't prove yet that this equals to that or this uh, is zero. Or, or it just proves that everything is proof modular element K3 because we proved that everything is zero modular, that coproduct vanishes. But then you calculate the integral and the integral in this case is a, the, just the one which I wrote down before, just this one. This is the integral. You see this integral is perfectly symmetric from all possible ways, in all possible ways. So it, it satisfies the hydral symmetry. Uh, it's, it's a cyclic symmetry. And uh, uh, let, let, let me just stop here. So I'm just saying that, that looking at the integral, you, you, you will see how, how, to, how, how to prove this property. There's a little subtlety here that maybe I don't want to discuss that this guy is naturally isomorphic to CM7, C2, C3 when you change the base point from zero to infinity. This is why you don't get a clean symmetry right away, but okay. <coughs> so we do have this symmetry, but this still uh, doesn't tell us uh, many things. So for example, you can say maybe these elements have many other relations which we don't, uh, didn't put on the blackboard. And uh, uh, so how they live in the, in the complex? So here is the answer to this question. So now let me recall that you have subgroup gamma one of P. Let me first of all assume that N is P, prime number. Then let me recall that there is subgroup gamma one of P which lives in the group GL to Z. And mm, let me introduce determinant called epsilon two. Then there's a theorem which says that if you consider this complex, the cochain complex of this cyclotomic Lie algebra, and calculate the i-dimensional cohomology of this complex. So this complex sits in degrees by definition one and two. So the cohomology uh, sits in degrees one and two. And so for one, not surprisingly, you get K3 of Sn, tensor Q. That's predicted because you have inside uh, K3, as was already explained. But H2 is uh, uh, given just by cohomology of this modular, uh, of this uh, gamma 1 P subgroup. So this is answer when I equals 2. So the point is that at this here, at this place, the cohomology group is coincides with uh, uh, part of the cohomology of group of gamma one P, in particular, it's non-trivial when P is at least eleven and higher. So huh? you put, should you put some weights on the plot? I mean oh, oh my goodness! You're absolutely right. I just forgot this. Ah, this was so bad mistake. This is C two, and we, this is just we are in weight two. Capital N is P. Capital N is P. I I, I now stick to prime numbers. So uh, this, for example, so actually raised the question so that we have a motivically algebra mapping to uh, the cyclotomically algebra and the generators go to generators, but in general we get quotient or we get the isomorphism. That was the question. So you see from this that you, will, you don't get isomorphism. So it's, it's not either if P at least is bigger equals than 11. In fact, we will see that we can do even a little better. Than that, it's. I just wanted to uh, say, kind of <coughs> passing this by because I'm not talking about this. That on the other hand, it's known. It's due to the Ling original that if you can put n equals two, three, four, six, and eight, then it's free. And the theorem of Brown, then if you put n equals one, it's also free. But on the other hand, it's not free. Uh, for other piece. 
Now, how do you prove this? Hmm? What's free? What? What is free? Okay, so I was uh, answering question of Akshay. Akshay basically asked the following question. He said, look, so this motivic Tately algebra of the scheme SN uh, maps uh, to motivic Tate Lee algebra, uh, to cyclotomic uh, uh, Lee algebra. It's, 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 yeah. it's map. And this map is definitely subjective because it's isomorphism of the generators. Uh -huh. Then the question was whether this map is isomorphism in general or not. I'm slightly lying here because I need to do little adjustment. I need to consider uh, actually the ring of cyclotomic integers and then make all these claims. It's a little, it's, it's a stronger claim. But then if I do this, the answer will be that it's sometimes free and uh, sometimes not. I mean, in many, if, if the weight is high enough. By free, you mean this is an isomorphism? Isomorphism, yes. So, sorry, sorry, sorry. So, uh, the, 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 uh, it's a faithful representation uh, for, for small number of ends, and it's definitely not faithful uh, for any prime, which is uh, when, the, when the, uh, the, the, the modular curve has homology. So homology is an abstraction to be, uh, to be isomorphism. Now, the question comes why. So where does it come from? It comes from a more interesting uh, statement. OK? I'm sorry, what do you mean by the determinant on gamma 1? I mean, it's a GL to Z. GL to Z, G, GL to Z has determinant. Yes. Gamma 1 is a subgroup which mod P, you know, a GL to Z. Oh, this is gamma 1? Yes, this is gamma, gamma 1. Yes. Yes. OK, now. Because if you look at this picture, the only way, I mean, in, so, so the image, the SIC is a free Lie algebra, any Lie algebra, an important Lie algebra, is free if and only if high cohomology of this L equal to 0 when i is bigger or equal to 2. OK? Actually, it's enough to say that i equals to 2. OK? So to, to tell that this Lie algebra is free or not to free, you have to calculate second cohomology of this Lie algebra. Uh -huh. And that's exactly what we did. Because what we did, we calculated cohomology of some particular complex, this one. But the uh, contribution to wedge 2 of C1 standing here, it cannot come from anywhere else except from uh, cyclic 2 just because of the weights. This guy lives in the, in the weight 2. And so the only way you can kill it when you go from something which lives in weight 2. And weight 2 is this, this, this guy. And, and we knew that L was free or something. That uh, which one? So we have two Lie algebras in question. So we have, uh, uh, we have motivically Lie algebra. Huh? To take the Lie algebra of all mixed state motives over, over any uh, scheme of integers is free. But here we're talking about representation of uh, this motivic state Lie algebra uh, related to, to, to cyclotomic field. And uh, it turns out to be not free in general. I mean, for, for, as I stated, for, for all this P bigger than w whenever H1 gamma P epsilon 2 has non trivial, something non trivial there. But as I said, there is a reason for this theorem. And the reason I found more interesting than the, the claim, uh, because Yes, I'm in weight 2. But that's already enough to handle the freeness. But uh, uh, so what is the reason? So uh, the point is that I can calculate not only cohomology of this complex, but I can calculate the complex itself. And this is much more information than calculating the cohomology. And so let me go to this calculation. So first of all, I need to introduce something which I call the modular complex. Uh, for GL2. So you take upper half plane. And you take the standard classical uh, triangulation of upper half plane. And so on. Now, uh, 
uh, you consider chain complex of this triangulation, which consists of triangles and edges, which means that you produce a complex, which I denote this way, which has two terms. One term I called uh, triangles, and one term comes from the edges. Now, this is by definition the free abelian group generated by oriented triangles. And this is, by definition, the free abelian group generated by oriented edges. Now, the group GL2Z acts on everything, not SL2Z, GL2Z. Because the group GL2Z x on c minus r, and therefore it acts on the quotient by the relation that z equals to z bar, which is nothing else but the upper half plane. So we have action of uh, GL to z. And therefore, it acts on the modular complex. Now, uh, the main theorem for GL2 is this. implies the previous one, is that there exist canonical uh, isomorphism of complexes. I guess I didn't explain. So this is triangles, this is the edges. But the differential d is just the boundary of a triangle is the sum of three edges. And so uh, I take one of the complexes, m to 1, going to m to 2. And I take it, I, I push it down to the modular curve, which means uh, literally formally that I take tensor product over gamma 1 of p with q. And then I map it the way I'm going to explain now. That's called theta 1 to the sig 2 of mu p uh, modular k3 of sp. And here I map it to which two, let me just write it down, O of sp star. So I, may I have this diagram, and I claim that this diagram is actually uh. isomorphism of complexes. And so it is this diagram which implies this theorem on the top, because uh, the modular complex calculates homology. Uh, it's OK. Now, how you construct this map? So let me introduce some notations. Let me say that you have subgroup D2 in GL to Z. Uh, which is order 12 dihedral subgroup. And you have subgroup D11 also here, which is order 8 subgroup. Uh, the last one is given by the matrices like plus minus 1, plus minus 1 and also as a diagonal. So we have two subgroups, and, uh, which I need in a second. And the claim is this, that actually this, uh, the left term is the complex, m2, 1, uh, which is tensor gamma 1 of p. Q or Z. Let's do it with Z. This is the same thing as a uh, free abelian group of GL2Z divided by gamma 1 of P tensor over the dihedral group with this character zeta 2. 
which in plain language is just uh, the free abelian group generated by uh, elements alpha, beta, gamma. Uh, uh, OK, so such that alpha plus beta plus gamma equal to 0. And then the first two, so I write this belong to fp square minus 0. OK, it's too bad. So it's element like that, where alpha, beta, gamma belongs to fp. The sum of these elements is 0. This basically tells you that the third element is recovered from the first two. And this alpha, beta, the first two elements, just belongs to fp square minus 0. OK? So it is this uh, little abelian group divided by dihedral relations. After this, uh, the map um, okay, how I wanted to write it down. So the map set of one is it yes, it's set of one. Um, the one set of one takes uh, uh, this generators raised just mod p alpha beta gamma to you fix some root of unity and then zeta p alpha zeta p beta zeta p gamma and I will still have to explain the uh, the notation here. So it's, uh, I'll tell in a second. So it basically goes to the element which we consider up to little. Uh, renumeration. Is there any question so far? No, okay. So, so what is M12? M12 is, so you have, you have this guy. So the group GL2Z acts on triangles, on oriented triangles. Now you calculate the stabilizer of the section. The stabilizer, the subgroup which stabilizes the triangle, uh, has not six but twelve elements because it's U N G L to Z. You're allowed to go down and up, so it's twelve elements, and it acts with a sign because this oriented triangle. So this gives you uh, a D two uh, tensor psi two uh, sign there. Now uh, I still need to do this uh, modular. I need to take this modular complex, which I I just described in this term, but I need to project the covariance by gamma one of p. Is that OK? It's still not OK. I don't ah. see Ah, so you just take, so it's basically a description. Forget about this tensor D2. So you just describe the cosets. You take matrix alpha, beta, you take matrix, I don't know, A, B, C, D, uh, and you act on row 0, 1. So you get A and C. OK? But then you can uh, add a You can add a dummy variable gamma, which makes this sum to 0. So you basically get this. This is your alphabet from that description. OK? But then, you, as I said, you get it's convenient to add some dummy variable, which is minus some of the previous two. I'm given some construction, so let me just uh, kind of finish. And then, then uh, it's, uh, so, so uh, I was saying that this goes to this guy, but I did not define this guy before, because before I was defining this guy, with, I put these two brackets here. So the point is that whenever we have, there's a little, but very important thing which happens here. So before I introduced motivic correlators in general, which I called CM, if I don't have zeros, they look like that, zero zeta m. But now I want to have the twins, pay attention, which goes with commas, zeta n. And uh, let me maybe, yeah, OK. Then this is by definition is the original ones, CM, 
of some others, let's call delta 0, and so on, delta n. Now here, I have to put conditions that the product zeta 0 times and so on times zeta n equals to 1. This is the condition under which this guy is defined. And this guy has a property that it's invariant under a scaling. It's like projective. Well, lambda is root of unity. So you can you could kind of homogeneous elements, and this is elements where the product is one. And you can recalculate. You can, if you have these guys, you can introduce those guys, just by saying that this delta i. Okay, how do you do this? So you better if you have those guys, you say that zeta i is like delta i divided by delta i plus one. This is how you relate these two guys. This, this looks like a nasty trick, but it's very important for what is going to happen uh, a little later. So I was saying that the, the correlators naturally give me some elements of motivically algebra, which are homogeneous with respect to simultaneous rescaling by root of unity. And I can create some other elements, just reparameterize re them in a, in a way which I wanted here. And in a second, I will claim that both of them satisfy some nice system of equations, the shuffle relations. This guy satisfies shuffle relations. This guy satisfies shuffle relations. And when they put together, you get really the system of relations you're looking for. So it's not enough to, to play with one set of the generators. So you have to somehow, uh, uh, yes. Yeah. Oh. Once again. No, no, no. So before, I was using correlators, which depend on n plus 1 roots of unity, yeah. and has the property that when you rescale all of them, they are the same. Yeah. That's why I put here two dots. It's like they're projective. Cyclic. They're cyclic, yes. Yeah, they're cyclic, yes, yes, yes. They're cyclic, two but still. Yes. Two dots versus a comma. Two dots, it's a projective uh, coordinate, so to speak. It's invariant under a scaling. OK? It's a general fact. If you have any abelian group, and, and, and so the, the number of indices is the same. The it's exactly the same, n, n plus 1. Mm -hmm. But the point is that those guys with comma, they're not arbitrary. Their product is 1. This is a condition. I don't know why. Yes, yes, yes. But now I, I, I now broke the cyclic symmetry. And I, I, this condition is cyclically invariant, so I don't have a problem with that. Right? Okay. So any collection of a, any gadget which depends projectively on elements of some abelian group can be written as another gadget. Uh, which defined only when this element sum to 1 or to 0 uh, in this group by using this transition formula that, you, that 1 uh, is just the ratio of the neighbors of, of, of the other parameterization. OK? I, huh? I thought before when we had the colon, there were all these zeros. What? Before when you wrote down I am not paying attention to zeros right now. I'm just considering the, the subspace of the uh, material correlators which don't have zeros. OK. That's, that's all. All right? This is important. But and so the map, when I define the map, I go to the second guys with commas, as Peter said. So, this is, so, so basically, I just describe combinatorially what is the coset of triangles you get when you take coinvariance with respect to the modular subgroup. So just a finite set. And then I define a map. So basically, I can say that I get modular curve with a kind of triangulation, and each triangle produces me some motivic correlator. OK? Now, what is the second map? So the second map, first of all, I need to parameterize by in a, in a similar way. So I need to uh, give a concrete parameterization. But then it's even simpler. So this M2 2 tensor gamma 1 P Z is nothing else as a free abelian group uh, generated by pairs alpha and beta and Fp square minus 0. 
uh, divided by this eight group relations that alpha beta is minus beta alpha and is the same as plus minus alpha plus minus beta. And the reason it appears on the blackboard because this is just a free abelian group generated by GL2Z gamma 1P uh, tensor this other group, D11 psi 2. So I'm saying that the group generated by the edges, this, this group, by the edges, is calculated as follows. So first of all, G to Z acts transitively on the set of all edges. Secondly, the stabilizer is a group of eight elements in GL to Z. And this is precisely this, the group D11. And then it acts on the generator with a character, because the generator records the orientation. OK? Ah, uh, I didn't. Uh, this is right, right hand side. No, 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 uh, same one, same one. You take cosets and record the cosets, alpha, beta. Yeah, yeah, you, as I was writing somewhere, you apply one, zero, matrix A, B, C, D, and then you record what you get. Hmm? You get A, B. OK, now the map, the second map, takes alpha, beta to uh, zeta alpha minus zeta minus alpha, which zeta beta minus minus beta. And now the, the claim is that this is a map of complexes, and actually isomorphism of complexes. OK? So the claim that this is isomorphism of complexes follows from the coproduct formula. OK? After this uh, unfortunate reparameterization, which is necessary to make this tr be true. Uh, uh, so, so we get a map of complexes. Now, why this is an isomorphism? Is there some questions? Because I finished construction now. Is this a coincidence? Huh? Is this a coincidence? Oh, this is an excellent question. So this is what I expected. So you can say this is a pure coincidence, and it's really just, uh, you know, it so happens, so it has no meaning whatsoever. Because I get h1 of gamma 1 of p, and h1 of gamma 1 of p is a group of certain rank, and you can calculate this rank, and that's it. Now, it turns out that it's not, because if you go to the weight 3 and do exactly the same procedure with the weight 3, you get a three-term complex. And this three-term complex, in a completely similar way, is quasi-isomorphic to the chain complex of a certain five-dimensional uh, manifold. This five-dimensional manifold is a five-dimensional symmetric space for SL3R uh, divided by the group gamma 1 of p there. And there, the result is the same, that the cohomology of that complex is calculated by H2, H1, H2, and H3 of this gamma 1 of p. But those uh, subgroups are such that their ranks cannot be calculated by any formula. And so if you get two parts, if you get two mathematical objects. Way too fast. Now it's getting interesting. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> what? It's getting interesting, and you're going way too fast. <laughs> but. <laughs> OK. So I'm answering question. I'm not. Uh, so, <laughs> okay. Let me answer question on the blackboards yeah, because. Huh? Why don't you finish the proof of this first, and then? Uh, okay. But <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel I have a legitimate question before. <laughs> 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 it, it, it seems you have a homology rather than a cohomology. Oh, is you take the the Borel Moore, so it, it's okay. Oh, you are doing more yes. Borel Moore. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I think it's correct. Now finish the statement. So, so to finish, uh, so I de define it maps like that. I also define it the two differentials, and I claim that the diagram is commutative, and this is just a straightforward application of the co-product formula. Now it is very easy to see that this map is an isomorphism because you know perfectly well who are the cyclotomic uh, elements are. They just satisfy the relation that one minus zeta p alpha equals modulo torsion one minus 
zeta p minus alpha, more latorsion. O is even better. You can just say, OK, so, so that's, that's what you say. So, so you know how many of them. But you have also a very concrete description of this guy. And you just see that they match, literally. So this is literally an isomorphism. There is nothing to prove here. After that, you have a diagram which is surjective by definition, commutative isomorphism here. And so I claim that this plus maybe epsilon enough to claim that this diagram is isomorphism. Because if you would have anything which sits in the kernel of this map, sorry, in the kernel of this map, this means that if you would have any relation between these motivic correlators modular k3, this would lead to some relation between these triangles on the modular curve. But there is none. So this proves that there are no more relations between the cyclotomic elements. And this also proves that this map is an isomorphism. And so we proved all the, so this diagram has complete information. So after this, we know this, uh, cyclotom this the, the way two cyclotomic part completely. We know generators, relations, coproduct, everything. And so we just described it explicitly in terms of this complex. So I didn't follow the proof of the injectivity of C to 1. Uh, that's important. So let's suppose that you have some relation between this uh, motivic correlators with three zetas, right? besides the hidal symmetry relations. Yes. This means that the, the, the linear combination is either 0 or belongs to K3. Yes. This means that it dies under the coproduct. Yes. But in this case, if you pull it back here, the element you find here also will be dying under this uh, boundary map. Any relation here will tell you that there is some relation here, yes. which is not possible. Because there is no homology here. This map, uh, after you take coinvariance, this map is injective. It's like statement that you have triangulation of your modular curve. And the statement is that each of these triangles produces some motivic correlator. And the statement there is no relation between the correlators is a statement that uh, all relations between them is the symmetries of these triangles. There is no other relations. So it's obvious upstairs, but uh, very non-obvious downstairs. Okay? OK? All right, now I'm going to answer. Uh, I'm going to wait three. I will not have time to finish, but at least I'll tell you what's going on. Uh, by the way, so it's, it's, it's true in weight 3 and true in weight it, in for GL3 and GL4, so it doesn't stop just in GL3. But next is weight 3. Sorry, it does stop in GL4? Uh, I just don't know. I mean, it's, I, I, it somehow should break, but uh, it's too complicated. Okay. Uh, so, OK, so in the weight 3, you have these guys. You have motivic correlators of, let's, let me put it in this comma way. And so you have a complex consistent of all of them. So you can, then you can map it. So if you can just take 6, 3 of mu p. Then you can map it to, in the chain complex, it maps to 6, 2 of mu p, uh, tensor of h, 6, 1 of mu p. And it maps to h3 of this cyclotomic unit of sp star. So I have a complex with three terms. And if I want to get out of trouble, I would rather take it modular depth filtration. It's a little thing which makes things a little more convenient. But I do know what happens in lower days, so it's not, not a problem. So then the claim is that this. I just push it down uh, uh, to, to I, I kill everything in depth two. I work modular depths two. I can explain what happens in depths too, but just this time I work modular depths too. So I get length three complex, and I claim that this length three, first of all, it has cohomology. That's cohomology of this is just so the, in degree one, two, and three. This is precisely h i of gamma one p in G L three. Uh, I guess with coefficients in q. I uh, this is good. This is a subgroup which mod p mod 
Mod Modly. And I created an analog of this in the case of weight 3. So I describe completely the, topo the geometry of this semantic space in a very similar way to this one. So I, I draw some five-dimensional cells, four-dimensional cells, three-dimensional cells, and two-dimensional cells. And then I match them to the elements of the Cochin complex. So just as before, every, uh, for example, those guys in weight 3, they're going to correspond one to one to certain four cells in this uh, symmetric space for GL3. And I can tell you who the cells are. And this, you can do this for GLN. So I can tell you how to start with motivic uh, correlator of n plus 1 zetas and produce to them certain cell of dimension 2n minus 2, I guess, in the sim No, it, it's it's not it's uh, no 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 I, I'm doing I'm just I'm doing this first of all for GL three Z so I'm doing some construction. Yeah, but even a fundamental domain for GL N Z and GL N R is complicated. It's complicated. But I can handle this. But I can handle this for GL three Z. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So Gauss I'm did that. huh? I think Gauss did that. <laughs> I attribute this to Voronoi, the the the, the 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 device which I use here. But I don't do precisely. It's a little more interesting than than you think it is. So, so I'm saying that there is some construction. So I'm kind of getting out of time and out of somehow the. But you, you raised the most important. In this injectivity over there. Yes. You sort of hinted that you knew what these homology groups, their ranks were exactly. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And so in this case, I have no idea how to calculate these cohomology groups. There are some uh, unknowns, and I don't think uh, we know too much about them. And nevertheless, but we know that they're non-zero sometimes. Yeah. And so nevertheless, this result tells you that if you study the cyclotomically algebra, then you kind of bound to this unknown to your cohomology group, no matter what. So this uh, relation between the geometry of GL3Z and this weight 3 part of, of cyclotomic complex cannot be accidental, because it's expressed through the quantities which doesn't have any other name. That's, what I'm, that's, that's my answer to, to Yanis. So, Uh, I have to look at the paper. I, <laughs> I, 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 I think I, I think I'm not, but I, I, it's either not or determinant. But I, I just forgot from the paper. But I, 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 I will look and I'll tell you. It's, it's follows from construction, but I don't want to mislead you. Uh, I think I know. I am not, but I may be incorrect. Hmm? What? What? Yes. OK, so Pierre's question. Pierre's question is the following. Do we really see the modular curve? The answer is yes. And that's another construction which follows up this. So, there is, so what I'm saying is that there is an explanation where does this relation come from. And the explanation goes as follows. So you deform this picture to the, to the modular curve. So this means, let me just say this. I'm answering questions because I still think that in 10 minutes I will not be able to produce coherent discussion. So now I consider the universal elliptic curve over the modular curve 1, one of n. And so I can still play the correlator game. So I can take motivic correlators, which corresponds to uh, torsion points here. Let's call them a0, a1, and a2. And I get something out of this. And I get something out of these correlators. So this turns out to be just this Ziegel's, uh, 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 this is Ziegel units. This is a theorem. The correlator in the simplest case gives a Ziegel unit of the difference of the torsion points. This is, I mean, this AI is a torsion points and torsion. So then you understand completely what this is. And then the question is, who are these guys? So you end up with a certain complex. So what happens is that you take this complex and you map it to certain motivic complex on modular curve. And this map is very close. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, it doesn't kill too much, I would say. Uh, so, so you have this map. And the image of this map of this group is going to be this balanced cutter euler system. Uh, the image here is something else, but that's what we're looking for. We, we want to understand the image of this guy. But in any case, you go to modular complex, and then you can specialize 
at cusp. If you take the composition, you get this map. So this way, you see all the modular forms. You see all geometry of the modular curves by deforming this to the modular curve. The question whether we can do this, not, but I'm saying that this picture, this one, exists for GL3, exists for GL4. Now the question how it deforms, that's a very interesting question. So I'm not giving you the answer at the moment. And, OK? And more. Well, Brown's, Brown's theorem, from my point of view, was uh, there was this ansatz taking zeta 2, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, and so on in Hoffman conjectures. Then you just apply the coproduct formula, and it's, uh, you see that it's in the same, it preserves, coproduct preserves the structure. And then you have to, to control the kernel. That, that's it. And, and it's the control of the kernel. Okay. So it's, it's a, the idea to consider the 2, 3, three this Hoffman conjecture somehow, it's, uh, uh, in this way, yeah. this way three case, I have a question. In this way three case, there are many triangulations of this space. You use the Voronoi. Use I the use the Voronoi. I, I use I use cell decomposition, which comes from Voronoi. Yeah. Okay, so since we are playing like uh, answer question, which is good, let me just give you the answer. Yeah. So for GLN, what I'm going to do for GLN, what kind of cell I'm going to construct for GLN? Okay, because I I, I don't have time to. OK, so the, the problem which I'm going to discuss right now is, uh, uh, is this. So I'm going to take element, this material correlator of zeta 0, zeta 1, and so on, zeta m. And I'm going to produce out of this certain 2m minus 2 cell uh, in hm. And this HM is uh, the symmetric space. So this is, uh, this is what you think. So this is symmetric space for the group GLM. So you can write this. This is GLMR divided by OM times R star, OM R star. Now, and this is the same, that's important, as positively definite uh, symmetric forms. OK. Now, uh, so what I want to do, I wanted to start with this, this motivi correlator and put this correlator to a certain cell. Now, I need to construct this cell. And here is it. But in order to do this, I need to rec recall the construction of the, uh, uh, the Voronoi construction. Voronoi cell decomposition of HM. So you start with a lattice, uh, which is a lattice in m-dimensional vector space. So this is a lattice. And uh, you assign to every vector v of this lattice uh, the quadratic form phi of v, which is v dot squared. Okay. This is quadratic form on the dual vector space, all right? Then you take a convex hull uh, of uh, this phi of L, where L runs through your lattice, through primitive. L is non-zero primitive element in this lattice. And so you get infinite polyhedra. Then uh, you project it uh, down, uh, project to HM. That's it. This is the Voronoi cell. So you take uh, convex hull of these guys. And if you do, for example, for M equals to 2, then you see the following picture. You see that you have a cone of your positively definite quadratic forms. And this cone comes with some elements. When it takes a complex hu convex hull, you're going to see this famous modular triangulation. That's where does it come from, from points of view of Voronoi. OK? Now, what I'm doing, I'm doing some construction, which runs as follows, which uses this. 
Mm. Okay. I do want to finish more or less on time, so uh, this means just want to give you some construction. Mm. So construction. Take a plane trivalent tree T uh, with uh, m plus one legs uh, labeled cyclically uh, by what I call a fine basis. This affine basis is just a collection of elements E0, E1, and so on. Em in this lattice Lm such as the sum of these elements is zero. That's a very important condition. So this and any m of them form a basis. Now then you took this tree, so now use this tree as follows. So so you have a plane trivalent tree, so it's something like that. Now you put here some elements like E0, E1. This is elements of your lattice. 3, E4, E5, E6, E7. So you put this on the boundary. Then uh, what you do, you take some edge. You take edge E of this graph. And now to this edge E, you assign uh, a vector. I would say plus minus vector, which I call plus minus Fe. This vector is well defined only up to sine. And in order to define this vector, you take one of the trees which grow, let's say, down, or you can take the tree which grows up. So take the tree which grows up or down. So you can choose. Let's take, for example, the one which grows up. And then you just take the sum of those vectors. So this Fe is the sum of these Eis over uh, upper part. If you go down, you're going to get negative of this vector because sum of them is zero. So you end up with a vector, and now this vector uh, mm, produces the answer. Just actually, So the, this is the main definition. So now this map, so if you, mm, I'm going to attach to this uh, extended basis something, some cell. So this is just this extended basis, which you used to, to label your tree. You have your tree sitting here. And so you assign to, to this, you take a sum of what? So you have a collection of vectors, like Fe1, and so on, f e to m minus one. So you assign. So you assign to every edge of this tree. You assign your vector, but then these vectors, uh, you can take the convex hull of them. Of the corresponding phi f i. Okay. So this is a simplex, right? Now, no, no. You take either plus or minus. It doesn't matter. Uh, okay, so the vector Fe is defined up to a sign only. But what I need, I need the square, I need the linear function, I need the quadratic form which is given by the square of the linear functional defined by this vector. Therefore, it's well defined. No, no, it's a notation. Notation means, uh, I don't know, so I, this is a thing. Of, so, so you have to take this phi f e 1 and so on, phi f e 2 m minus 1. This is quadratic forms. Now you have to take the convex hull in the, in the ambient space. So you get the cell. But the point is that you take the sum of uh, all plane trivial entries. And you put the sign which we discussed in the lecture one. 
So that's the answer. And the answer tells us so, so that this is the map which you supposed to take. And now I probably want to do the following. I want to show how this works for GL3. I want to show how I reproduce the, the, the fundamental, the, the whole the guy for GL3 in terms of these pictures. I wish I have more space to that. Uh, so now I, I, would, I will have four cells, three cells, two cells. And this is GL3. Now, four cells will be of this shape. So uh, I'll have plane tree and trees like that. And so my construction produced me four cells. OK? Now, three cells I'm going to draw in two different ways. I either take graph which has four guys like that and apply a similar construction, or I take a join of the previous guys. Now, what this means, I mean, I didn't really explain. It's not trivalent. Oh. So the trivalent tree was just a, a piece of a bigger construction. So trivalent tree was just the answer to the question, what I assigned to motivic correlator itself. Now, but I want to make, can have a map which, a map of complexes from the cochain complex of this motivic Lie algebra. So this needs, this means that I need to assign some cells to the wedge product of motivic colorators colorator, and so on. And that's what I'm doing. Top means this. This one. I did not uh, really define it for you. So I defined what this symbol means. I'm saying that this is similar, but I didn't quite define this. So I, uh, I, 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 I want to give you the answer, but not all terms in this answer are yet defined. So this is defined, this is defined, this is defined. This I will have to add what this is, but it corresponds to this picture. Now, what this wedge product means, so this is like two cell, and this is like one cell. So you take uh, the convex hull of them. So what you get, again, is a three cell. It's like, you know, it's called join in geometry. So it is, I don't know. So it's, I put here E0, E1, minus E0, minus E1, and I put here E2, minus E2. And I, I just take some construction related to these two guys. And similar things happens here. I really go ahead of myself because I really didn't explain how exactly this holds. But what I'm saying, I'm saying that these guys give you, me all four cells. And there's a five cell here. And this five cell is nothing else but a second shuffle relation uh, for these uh, correlators. So this picture, so the, so the way I, I, I present the GL3 complex is that not only I see the cochain complex of my Lie algebra, I also see the, the, the single non-trivial relation which, I'm going, which is going to be kind of new in the weight three, which comes from the five cell. And so this, this whole five, this the, the symmetric space encodes all information about the weight three complex in this way. And then you can read all information about this uh, complex from, from, from this picture. So for example, you can prove a uh, corollary that there is no other relations between this motivic correlators between zeta 0, zeta 1, zeta 2, zeta 3, besides uh, these double shuffle relations. This is consequence of the fact that h1 of gamma 1, 3 p is 0, and this construction. And the fact that uh, this uh, handling of uh, symmetric space uh, knows about uh, the relations uh, which we, it knows about the second double shuffle relation it knows about the first because of the sum of plane trivial and trees construction here and knows about the second because of the five cell and same happens for GL4 but it's much more combinatorial involved so for GL4 is precisely the same result that if you take weight 4 complex then it calculates cohomology, which is degree 6, 5, 4, 3 for the corresponding symmetric space. That's exactly the cuspidal cohomology. Uh, you hit cuspidal cohomology there. When you go to higher, you're not going to hit them. You're going to start missing them. So <laughs> actually, I, so I, I know that it works out. I know how it works to weight 4. And I don't really know how it works uh, high, except that I know the general construction, which kind of tells me 
that the sum over plane trivial and trees tells me how to put this motivic correlator as a corresponding cell in the symmetric space. And the same. I know map of complexes in any degrees, but again, I don't have time to say all this. So, so uh, I, when I map a complexes, com complexes which I construct uh, is built from some generators which satisfies two sets of relations. Shuffle relations for this uh, project CM with, with two dots and shuffle relations for the, for, the, for the generators with commas. So when I map complexes, I know that my first set of relations will be satisfied and that the hidden symmetry will be satisfied. But the second set of relations, I have to work to see what this corresponds to. And what happens is they correspond to some higher cells. They tell you the reason why these uh, things are, so, so to speak, trivial. And so when I incorporate this, so I get, I, I get a statement about that the cohomology of my complex is precise as a cohomology of the corresponding modular variety in, in a clean way. But uh, so the answer is, yes, I have a map of complexes for any M, but it doesn't respect uh, only part of the relations. Uh, it respects only part of the relations. The other part I have to work to, to put into the game. And that's where somehow dimension starts to grow. And I don't understand how this. I, I can make only statements that if you take last cohomology group of this uh, Armic, Chevalier Armic complex of the sig mu p, let's say, in degree w, in degree m, that's going to be something like hm of gamma 1 mp. That's true. But uh, the previous cohomology uh, is, I mean, I, I can handle a little bit of them, but I don't have a statement, even a conjecture, what, what's going to happen. So the answer is that I don't have even a conjecture what happens, for example, if you take cohomology of weight 100 complex here. I know it somehow relates to symmetric spaces. I don't know who they are. So up to weight 4, they are precisely the cohomology of the discrete subgroup. High, if you go higher, I don't know what happens. This is what the Hodge correlator game was designed for. Because what happens here, I apply some construction. I'm saying that these motivic correlators, they produce you some cells here. On the other hand, I didn't get this question, and I'm a little surprised. So I use exactly the same construction to do the, the Hodge correlators. So it's exactly the same sum of plane trivial and tree, exactly the same. It looks exactly the same, except it's different. And this construction tends to the period of this guy. So, so you know the periods. They're given, yeah. So, OK, so you have, so the main guy in the game is motivic correlator uh, of this zeta 0, comma, zeta 1, comma, and so on, zeta m. Let's consider, let's put no zeros here. So you have this guy. So I'm saying that on one hand, send, on one hand side, this guy produces a certain 2m minus 2 cell which knows uh, amazingly a lot about it. It knows the coproduct of these guys is reflected in the boundary of this cell. It's a map of complexes. On the other hand, I can make a number out of this. This was this Hodge correlator construction. So, and what is interesting is that the construction here and the construction here look very much the same, except that they're in a different setups, but they, they use the same sum of plane trivial entries and same kind of mechanism. Uh, I don't say this. I say that this cell, but this cell, uh, this cell has a boundary, and the boundary of this cell is a kind of pro wedge products of a similar cells, and so this shape, this shape of the structure, that the boundary of the cell is given by a wedge product of two cells of lower like dimension. This matches precisely the formula for the coproduct. This is why this construction somehow remembers about the comproducts. That's why this contract uh, produces a map of complexes. Because this cell has the property, this boundary knows, knows, uh, knows about the, the coproduct of the original element. The only thing, so then in order to, to capture this element, all you need to know, you need to know the number, the period which corresponds to it, which the other construction does. So in a sense, uh, I have the data which I need, but that's. Are you sure you want to jump from uh, here to there? <laughs> because there is a talk at uh, like in 20 minutes. 
I, last, last 20 minutes, I basically was answering questions. So I, I didn't quite give you the definitions uh, in many places here. I just gave you somehow the shape, how it looks like. Oh, yes, it's important. So if I have, that's a very good question. So let me just answer this question. And uh, so uh, the cyclotomic units satisfy the, how is this called, distribution, uh, distribution relations. I mean, if you have zeta 12, uh, you know. So you, d zeta p square, there, there are some distribution relations, right? So these distribution relations are uh, not reflected that well in this map of complexes. So, th so when, you, when, you, when you take n b power of p, the map becomes not isomorphism, but a surjective map. And you have to encount to this uh, distribution relations. When you deform this to elliptic curve, you, they st they, they, you, you catch them. But when you specialize to, to cusp, you get this phenomena that you get in the target distribution relations, which you, which you didn't have in your geometrical picture. And this starts to. Uh, this, this makes a problem. So if I want to do calculation for p square, it's, uh, uh, this, this is the only problem. Uh, and uh, it's not clear how to handle this problem. So the answer is extremely important. Uh, 